Yeah, good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome from my side. My name is Bettina Kronberg, and I'm directing the IFA Gallery in Stuttgart since the beginning of this year. And so far, we couldn't host that many um, events here in the gallery space, so I'm really happy that we can be here today all together to share thoughts and experiences. And especially because today we start into the celebration of 50 years IFA Gallery, which opened its doors in 1971, and which has always been a vital and pluralistic space of encounter and exchange. Tomorrow we will have an all-day summer celebration, so you're all very welcome to join again. We will start at 2 p.m. Uh, with guided tours through the ex exhibition A Natural Order of Things, in which we are right now sitting, as well as um, tours behind the scenes, which takes you through the deep time of the IFA building, workshops, conversations about the history of the IFA, art department as well as the gallery and experimental electronic music in the evening. But back to the present moment. I'm very pleased to welcome our guests of tonight, Dr. Swetal A. Patel and Dr. Melanie Fiedmeier. Um, to the second session of our conversation series Biennale Talks. Approaching and engaging with the multifaceted and also controversial phenomenon of biennials in its very diverse manifestations, formats, and histories. So let me briefly introduce tonight's speakers. Dr. Melanie Fiedmeier is an art historian, curator, researching transcultural networks between Africa, Latin America, and Europe in modern and contemporary art worlds with a wide range engagement and expertise in the global art field from which I will only mention a few. She holds a PhD from the Leuphana University Lüneburg, realized in the context of the research group Rep Representation, Visuality, Knowledge. From 2015 to um, 19, she was a member of the research and exhibition project initiated by the German Federal Cultural Foundation Museum Global, Microhistories of an Eccentric Modernity at the Kunstsammlung Nordrhein-Westfalen, for which she curated the microhistory of modernist art in Brazil. In 2019, she was also a fellow of the Transregional Academy on Latin American Art, Spaces of Art, Concepts and impacts in and outside Latin America and Mexico City. Currently, she is co-curating an exhibition of con contemporary art on the topic of the restitution of cultural objects from colonial context from Africa at Atelier de la Vie de Nantes. And in parallel, she's writing the study biennials as seismographs for the IFA as part of the research program Culture and Foreign Policy. Dr. Swetal A. Patel is a writer and researcher working on the intersection of contemporary art and its production, exhibition-making practices, and development theory. He's a founding member of India's first visual arts biennial, the Kochi Mutsiris Biennial and holds a practice-based PhD from University of Southampton, Winchester School of Art. He has operated internationally, primarily in Europe and <coughs> Asia, within the arts and creative industries for over two decades and has contributed widely to journals, magazines, catalogues and other publications. He is an editor an editorial board member of On Curating Journal, advisor for the Calcutta Center for Creativity and the Kochi Mutsidis Biennial. And I think it is a great moment to start the celebration of IFA Gallery's anniversary with this conversation today as with the commemoration we are reflecting on the past and at the same time departing into a time to come. 
with a strong awareness that we need to commonly sensitize for and build up other modes of being in and relating to the world we inhabit. We are living in extremely disruptive, challenging and uncertain times, which are at the same time a great opportunity to reimagine and reshape the present and to rethink the past. Art and cultural spaces and programs have an enormous potential within this process of social transformation. And I'm sure we will get a lot of insights and impulses from our speakers today. How to find and define responsibility, also as the ability to respond to specific contexts and constellations. As today's title is, Biennial Practices, Interdisciplinary Approaches for a Sustainable Art Platform. And with that said, I hand over the world to Melanie and Sveta. Well, thank you very much, Bettina Kurintenberg, for the introduction. And thank you very much, Eva, for the invitation to this talk and the organization also to Valerie Hammerbacher. And well, welcome, Schwetter Patel. It's great to have you here. Thank you. And uh, well, you have diverse links to biennials, our topic today. So as we heard, you're a founding member of the Kuchi Musiris Biennale in India, but also you um, advised already in the late 2000s uh, the Indian uh, Ministry of Culture for the realization of an Indian pavilion at the Venice Biennial. And uh, recently you have been an advisor for Oslo Biennale, a newly founded biennial in Norway. And as we also heard, you're on the editorial you're an editorial board member of On Curating Journal, which already had several issues on the topic of biennials. So you're really an expert, so it's great to have you here. <laughs> and let me um, briefly introduce the topic um, of biennials for us today and also tell you a bit how we met, because it's in the framework of um, the recent study I'm doing for IFA uh, with the title Biennials as Seismographs or as Gauges. And uh, so in this framework, I did interviews with biennial directors and curators, biennial organizers, and this is also how we met virtually, at least <laughs> already. And so before posing my first question to you, let me um, well briefly introduce into the topic, because biennials, um, they reflect kind of like seismographs, current global issues that are important in the art world. And they're really, spaces for the production of art, they are spaces for freedom of opinion, freedom of artistic expression, also addressing socio-politically relevant questions, also difficult questions that are maybe not that easy to approach and address in political discourses, but art has always another freedom. But first and foremost, they are really spaces for the production of art, of new artworks, and well, the place for the presentation. And this is also what makes the magic of a biennial. So it's always an inspiring moment when you enter a biennial and you see so many newly produced artworks. Well, the term generally refers to exhibitions that take place every two years, mm -hmm. but m more generally also includes triennials or quadrennials or even the documenta, which takes place every five years um, in Kassel. And well, the biennial, which is the mother of all biennials, is the Venice Biennial, which was founded in 1895 and is still considered as the most important um, art event for contemporary art. And IFA is uh, the commissioner of the German Pavilion for already 50 years and really has a competence center for the discourse on biennials since many years. And well, biennials have proliferated all over the world in the last decades. And especially in the 1990s, there was a so-called biennialization boom, which saw a paradigmatic shift from a Eurocentric perspective to a more global perspective on art discourses. And so really from Dakar to Havana, from Jakarta in Indonesia to Curitiba in uh, Brazil, these places on the so-called periphery or from the global south have contributed um, really to reinventing the biennial format and are exploring new forms of curating and exhibition making. 
So currently there are more than 300 biennials worldwide and they exist really on every continent, including the Antarctic now. <laughs> So, and although in the current discourse on biennials there has been criticism concerning a homogenization and standardization of biennials, it is important to say that each biennial acts really differently and has to be placed in very specific geopolitical contexts. So also comparing biennials doesn't really make sense. <laughs> Uh, and also, so this counting of biennials has also been criticized heavily. You did it as well, <laughs> counting me, I did it as well. But also to show that this trend of proliferation continued also in the last year. So between 2015 and 2020, around 59 new biennials emerged. And these new biennials tend to show new trends in, in biennial formats and reinventing the biennial format. It doesn't say that other biennials, older biennials don't do it, but with new formats these trends become especially obvious. And um, also the founding scenario of biennials are interesting to have a look at. So we have an a tune here by Olaf Westphalen, who also sends his greeting to, to our talk with this uh, distracted city in the background and then the guy saying what our village needs now is the biennial. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting to look at the founding scenarios of biennials as well. Um, so has it been founded by a government, by a city or by artists maybe? Is it really a grassroots initiative? And because of this large number of biennials and the extreme diversity, it is really a challenge for funding institutions, like IFA as well, to design funding according to the real needs of the biennial. So my study also aimed at, um, well, really a survey of the promotion of biennials in order to identify both obstacles and potentials in the realization of biennials. So this also includes rethinking of certain criteria when we consider by the biennials to rethink uh, criteria like scope, visibility and size and replacing them by aspects of sustainability maybe. And so my study focused on the African continent, for example, of the 22 existing biennials um, at the moment on the African continent, 13 have been founded in the last decade. And uh, so it's interesting to see that because of their small budgets and because most of them are not government supported, certain needs become especially evident here and also new trends become evident. And some keywords of my research are, well, in the, in, well, the inclusiveness of biennials or the, the attempt to be inclusive the attempt to have more accessibility or reaching out into the urban space. So like art as a public domain and well programs like education and capacity building programs. But this is also true not only for the African continent but for biennials all over the world. And here by the Kochi Musiris Biennale for me is an excellent example. So it's great to have you here and to talk about aspects like sustainability, local context and funding in our today's talk. So um, could you tell us maybe a bit about Kochi Musiris Biennale? How was the founding scenario of this Biennale, which is the first visual art biennial in India, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, um, everybody, and thank you, Ether and Melanie, for this uh, opportunity. Um, the Kochi Musiris Biennale, of course, it's a biennial, so it happens every two years, but in 1968, the world's first triennale, triennale ever happening every three years, was um, created in New Delhi. Mm -hmm. This was very much part of the, kind of the post Second World War non alignment movement to create a kind of uh, a cultural network outside of the Eurocentric uh, model. And uh, Nehru, the Prime Minister of India at the time, Octavio Paz, the Mexican poet who was the ambassador, the cultural attache to the Mexican, Mexican embassy, embassy in New Delhi at the time, Mok Rajanand, uh, poet, writers, artists, uh, came up with an idea to create a triennale in India. But by the 80s, um, and this was a triennale that was really, in, I suppose, in the model of Venice, where you would invite different mm -hmm. countries and their embassies to create pavilions, send artists. But there were some incredible artists, you know, Donald Judd, and, and, and several others, mainly from the Global South. 
But by the 80s, this kind of uh, triennale had really lost its footing in many ways. And by the 90s, it had really disappeared. And this is also the period, um, I'm taking a little bit of a, a detour from your main question about the Cochibayano, just to give you some historical <coughs> context. Um, of course, in 1991, the Indian economy liberalizes. And I think this is really the point where Indian contemporary artists start to be exhibited mm -hmm. internationally. International museums, curators, etc., uh, start to uh, come to the subcontinent, and Indian artists, contemporary Indian artists, uh, really kind of flourish on the global scene, uh, along with other regions like China and, and, and so on. Um, so the market really took over, and so you had a flourishing of galleries, uh, mm -hmm. really not much of a state subsidized state-sponsored museum sector, certainly not in the contemporary arts. So I'd say there was a vacuum that led to the creation of the Kochi Biennial, in that there was a very vibrant market, there was a you know, very good fair in New Delhi that had emerged um, uh, by 2012. We started working on this project in 2010, and when the government of Kerala, the government that was in power at the time, uh, that belonged to the Communist Party of India, Marxists, um, the the Minister of Education and Culture, M.A. Baby, uh, approached two artists uh, of Malayali, of Kerala descent, who were in Bombay, very, very important artists, Bosco Shimachari and Riaz Como. And really, the government said, look, Kerala is, um, has a very important literature festival, very important film festival in Trivandrum, very important dance festival, but we don't do anything in the visual arts. So rather than government kind of, you know, imposing what its view of what visual arts should be, we want to talk to artists and you know, we want to know what your thoughts are. So the proposal that was immediately made um, in the summer of 2010 was that India needs a Biennale. And uh, maybe the perfect place for a new Biennale in India is not Delhi or Bombay or Chennai, one of the major cities, but actually in this little port island of Fort Kochi, which has you know, nearly two and a half thousand years of history, that region. Mm -hmm. It's a very important region in terms of cosmopolitanism. It's the first place where Judaism, Islam, and Christianity come to out of the Holy Lands, and they peacefully coexist with the with the Hindu population. So it's sort of really the idea of cosmo pre-enlightenment ideas of cosmopolitanism. This idea that you know different cultures, different religions, different societies living together in a very small geographical zone, um, thirteen different languages spoken, etc. So we really felt that. Uh, this was an incredible site. Mm -hmm. So we proposed that Fort Kochi should host this new biennial. And of course, government said, well, give us a proposal and, 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 and how would you do it? And that's when I got involved very early on uh, with the two founders. And um, we, we made a feasibility study. We, we went to you know, New Delhi to meet the prime minister's office. And we really proposed this idea. And um, luckily, the government supported us. So really, credit goes to the government. Credit goes to the artists. Um, for coming up with an idea, and um, that's really how it started. So it's really an artist founded, but with government support yeah, biennial. Yeah, we could have done it without government support. Yeah. As in politics, the government changed, so we were about, you know, about a year into our planning, and uh, the state government changed. And the new government that came on board, we had to sort of re-explain. We were originally supposed to open in November 2011, so we started working on it in the summer of 2010, so we worked about a year and a half, and then the government changed and you know, funding was really difficult. So we actually postponed the first edition to the mm -hmm. 12th of December, 12-12-12. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, uh, you know, government, but of course private patrons. So you know, people who uh, donated money, then um, of course uh, art councils, embassies, sponsorship. Uh, we, were, we were very lucky that BMW, Global Culture, um, Dr. Thomas Gerst, who we've met in Venice Biennale, um, before the biennial even launched, you know, they committed to sponsor us. So it was really, you know, a lot of different kind of stakeholders that came together. But the, but the primary patron of the Kochi Biennial is the government of Kerala. And they've remained, despite shifts in the political, um, you know, environment, with the, the, to, to the Congress and the CPI, uh, both, both, both parties, uh, when they've been in power, have supported the biennial. Um, and I don't think that's... Um, that's rare in India because contemporary art is sort mm -hmm, of seen as mm -hmm. something that maybe the private sector or the market can look after and government has other responsibilities, which of course um, is debatable. But, uh, but we've been very lucky that they've been supportive. 
Yeah, and a good location also, the, the choice of the location. So maybe yeah. we can have um, a look at the, the, because you brought three films along. So exactly. Maybe, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, maybe we can explain a little bit. So this, is a, this was a documentary made by Hattie Bowering, uh, which was shot at the, when we were making the first biennial. So we have no money, we have no equipment, we have no expertise. Um, none of us had done a biennial before. So this is really like, uh, uh, and then you'll see the next video is from 2016. So this was shot in December 2012, uh, or November, December 2012, in the build up to the first edition. And then the second video we're gonna watch is the 2016, a little kind of highlights of the 2016 uh, biennial, which is the third edition. So you kind of almost see a little bit of a contrast. Okay, so let's have a look to dive into the universe. Kuchi. Stuff like this. Yeah, I mean, this is so interesting. Also, it was said in the in the video that uh, yeah, really, it's it's the, the Biennale was also staged in zero infrastructure spaces. Yeah. So you really created it from from zero. And then I wonder how is the impact um, of this biennial on the city in general and also on the infrastructure for contemporary art? What does it mean? Absolutely. Biennial. I mean, this 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 river is called the Kalvaki River. Um, there's a port called Muzuris, so you may wonder, Muzuris doesn't exist on the map anymore. Um, but Muzuris is, a, is an old mythical port, it did exist. Um, uh, the Phoenicians, the Greeks, the Romans, it dates back two and a half thousand years. Um, it was really one of the centers of trade in the ancient world because spices, uh, coir, rubber, lots of things, uh, pepper, famously. Mm -hmm. um, in 1321, there was some sort of cataclysmic event environmental event. We think it's a kind of a tsunami maybe, but basically Muzuris was covered, a little bit like Atlantis, and it was lost. And for, for hundreds of years it was kind of talked about, but nobody really knew the exact location. Mm -hmm. uh, 1321, as this flood opened up some new waterways, and Fort Kochi, which this building is placed on, became the new harbor. And in 1530, uh, Vasco de Gama, looking for the new world, takes the wrong turn and ends up in Kochi, and it becomes really the beginning of the kind of early globalization, I would say, followed by the Dutch and the British um, across 400 years. This building it was started in 1857 by a Scottish trader called uh, Aspinwall, and this was an uh, export, you know, the, 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 a little bit like Venice, actually, a lot like Venice, where, you know, you have these maritime infrastructure. Um, but this was all crumbling, so you see in the first biennial, um, you know, this, these buildings were completely abandoned mm -hmm. and they were falling mm -hmm. apart. It was like this old historic jewel box. This building, we were very lucky. We found out who the owners were. It had been empty for about 15 years and we turned it into what our main site. Um, and I think to answer your question, it, it really realigned people's perceptions because this was something that was falling down. This was in the past. You know, people want new buildings of glass and metal and, you know, this old heritage stuff that's crumbling, you know, from another era. And so I think a lot of people took another sort of perspective on their environment, you know, that why mm -hmm. are artists coming here? Why are these people coming here? Why is, you know, why are these people flying in to see this place where we live here and we don't understand uh, the fascination? And so I think it made people really look at their environment in an interesting way. And there was a clip there in that video. We did a lot of work building up to the first biennial where we explained what a biennial was. Mm -hmm, and we did mm -hmm. it both in local language and in English. We really spelt it out to sort of say, this is what a biennial is, these are examples. And we started with schools. So we'd go into schools yeah. and, we, you know, mm -hmm. and then the, the children would go home to the parents and say, you know, look what I got today. I got a coloring book and I got this leaflet. And so it was really like kind of very bottom up uh, way of also uh, kind of trying to make people understand what we were doing because there was, of course, also opposition, you know, which is sometimes always the case when kind of projects like this start, you know, that mm -hmm. why mm -hmm. are they doing this? What is their motivation? And it was very funny, even government sort of said to us, what's your incentive? And we said, we want to create a non-profit art platform. They said, but why are you doing it? And we said, because we think it's important and artists need this, community needs to be, yes, but what are you getting out of it? And we said, well, nothing really. We don't even get paid very much. They well, why are you doing it then? Uh, and so then slowly people understood why we were doing it. But initially, we were very suspicious. That why are you going to all this effort in these old broken buildings? And why are you putting this art in there? You know. 
And I guess it's, it's uh, also quite a challenge when there is no infrastructure for contemporary art to introduce this contemporary Absolutely. art because also biennials are also a place um, well, where new art forms have been introduced Absolutely. largely. Yeah? So yeah. replacing painting, sculpture or, or drawing like the traditional media, let's say, to, to present more site-specific, research-based um, yeah. art which is not uh, maybe known to, to the population yet. So it, it's also a great en endeavor. So maybe also in the second film, I think this also becomes quite obvious. Yes, we really brought, and I think even in the first edition, we had music, theater, we had film program, we had children's programs, and you see how I mean, we were doing it because we really felt that was really important. But you see by the third edition how all of these programs really kind of matured into our kind of, uh, I suppose, a, a characteristic of our behind you. Yeah. Wow, so this really <laughs> makes us want to go there, <laughs> I think, <laughs> to experience the Biennale. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Is that? Okay. If, if you close it. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, because the Kuti Musiris Biennale has a very special tradition, namely they have Ar they um, have artists as curators and so I think this is a very interesting aspect. I mean uh, Roland Barthes proclaimed the death of the author <laughs> in 1967, now is it the death of the curator <laughs> that artists are uh, curating by any? It's, th it's not only in Kochi, it's also in Okayama where, um, well the triennial in Japan where Liam Gillick um, well, he curated the first edition in 2016. Now it was Pierre Eek for 2019, um, well, biennial. Yeah. What's, what's the uh, specialty maybe about artists curating biennials? Well, I think historically there are lots of precedents of artists self-organizing, right? Even, uh, you know, back in Paris in the 18th century, um, uh, you know, artists were self-organizing. You know, the Impressionists self-organized their first mm -hmm. exhibition. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the YBAs ex uh, first organized their own exhibition and, and, and throughout I think art history artists have, uh, have curated or curated themselves and curated their colleagues. So I don't think um, uh, that's particularly let's say a, a new thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that as a biennial to kind of resolutely say we're artists founded, artists led and artists curated and sort of not as a dogmatic thing to say that, you know, because of course, you know, none of us work individually. We, we need to collaborate. And biennials are a really good example of lots of different kinds of people coming together. You know, it's not just the curators and the artists, right? Although they get the headlines, um, it, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a whole ecosystem of people, either, you know, directly or indirectly involved with the biennial. I think in our case, because it was artists initiated, the two artists founders curated, co-curated the first edition. And then um, there was a lot of discussion and we really felt, let's continue, let's sort of see. So it's not a dogmatic thing to say we will never, you know, only ever okay. work with artists. Mm -hmm. But uh, so far, I think it's just a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of, you know, having artists curate, I think on the subcontinent is also uh, a factor in that, mm -hmm. I don't know if curatorial practices have really caught up perhaps, you know, I don't want to go too deeply into this, but I just think that, I just think that the artists that we've had curate, so Jitish Galat who curated the second edition, Sudha Shanshetti who curated the uh, third edition, and then Anita Dubey, an artist based in Delhi who curated the fourth edition, and now our next edition is also curated by an artist, Shubigi Rao, who's based in Singapore, who'll be representing Singapore at the Venice Biennale next spring. Um, I think they bring uh, a different toolkit, mm -hmm. but of course they work with curators or let's say, you know, uh, trained curators. So I don't think that we're trying to replace the role of the curator, um, but I think that having artists curate just brings another sensibility perhaps. And mm -hmm. I think there are, and this is a larger discussion I think on the subcontinent, there are a lot of practices that maybe evade normal curatorial practice that perhaps artists are more attuned to perhaps. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, in Sudarshan's case, you know, writers, theatre performers, musicians, um, you know, uh, people who, you know, um, may not be considered part of the art world, were yeah. kind of brought in, um, yeah. you know, different reference points than perhaps curatorial trends. 
yeah. uh, that are kind of you know global in some ways. So Shubhi Girao, who is curating the current um, edition uh, yeah. of um, Kochi Musiris Biennale, seems to be really close to to the artists and also something which is really important is the site, yeah, the Absolutely. locations. Yeah. So also you are inviting artists to come to Kochi yes. to work really with the place, yes. with the history. Um, so site specificity is one of the key words in the sure. biennial discourse in the, in the last decade, maybe one in the last years. So um, I wonder uh, what does it mean for Kochi? this site-specific approach. Yeah, you know, it, it, what, what, what we did from the first biennial onwards, when, when you saw some of the buildings were really in a yeah. very, I mean, the jungle, you know, it was kind of a jungle, that site. Uh, there were snakes and it was horrible. Oh, well, dangerous, you know, but um, luckily no one got uh, injured. Um, but um, what we would do is invite the artists for a site visit, at least, you know, several months before the biennial. And oftentimes, the curators may have had an idea, they say, I'm going to invite this artist because I'm interested in that work, or I saw this work and maybe we can, you know, develop that work here. And oftentimes the artist would come for their site visit and the project would completely change because mm -hmm. they would be inspired, they would see a space and they would say, I want to work in this space, or they would visit somebody or some place in Kochi or around Kochi and then use that as a reference. So what we realized was that, the, you know, oftentimes projects completely changed. Mm -hmm. And again, I think, I don't know if this was really artist, uh, you know, uh, the, the impact of being artist organized, we're very open to it. So it wasn't really, it was a conversation as opposed to this is the work we want, ship it, or, you know, can you send this? And this is the framework that we want you to kind of perform in. Mm -hmm. You know, it was much more a conversation. And as I said, oftentimes the, um, the projects completely change. So, you know, um, I think we, we did some sort of calculations and you'll see in the presentation later we really had to justify our Biennale so we used to do all this kind of econometric kind of analysis which I you know over the years I'm not so much a fan of but it does communicate uh, what we're trying to do but it, nearly around 75% of the work in the first Biennale was site specific um, you know even if it was an existing work that was modified for the space and I think that's interesting you know I think what's disappointing sometimes is that just the kind of import export of work in the art world you know um, and it's great to see artists and practitioners and different people responding to a place um, we yeah. also one other thing I would say is that you know oftentimes some very famous artists uh, we've had in the biennial and you would meet them in you know Venice or in Bombay or New York or whatever and you'd, you know you'd go to their studio or you'd meet them socially in an opening and you know there would be a kind of a little bit of a distance you know or let's say a kind of you know but when everybody came to Kochi, you know, after a day or two, so relaxed, really like open to things, you know. <laughs> so all of that kind of baggage drops mm -hmm. because, you know, you're in this very beautiful place full of opportunity and, you know, people kind of just shed some of that kind of, um, you know, maybe some, uh, but that's, that was my personal view that I really felt art is very relaxed, you know, became relaxed, became open. And then, you know, made it easier in some ways because we didn't have, all the resources in the world. We didn't have the best spaces. We didn't have climate controlled rules. Mm -hmm. We didn't have, you know, all the things that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, perhaps more um, affluent biennials had. But it was okay because it was a conversation, you know, and if a light wasn't working or the electricity went off, it wasn't like a big drama, yeah. you know, everybody yeah. was, it was just so, you know, it was a very kind of collegiate atmosphere. I think it really helped because otherwise we would have been sunk yeah. in that river. It would have been <laughs> difficult, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, well, so you, you mentioned the affluent um, biennial, so the really large scale um, mega show exhibitions. But um, so I think this is very important to also look at this bottom up approach. And when talking about site specificity, I think it's interesting to see in your research and uh, your talks that you are, um, well, um, including two other concepts, which is ethic specific and site conscious which is a very important nuance maybe to um, site specificity. So maybe could you elaborate on, on these aspects? Yeah, actually we have Ronald Kolb here from ZHDK and um, it, 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 these, these ideas sort of emerged 
uh, through research that I was doing with Zetadika and these two editions of On Curating that we yeah. did in my PhD thesis. And, you know, site specificity, which is, of course, uh, uh, really um, uh, something very well known in the art world, and I think that people understand uh, what it means, uh, but it really site and something specific. Um, something made for a site, um, etc. But I thought, well, how do you take these ideas further to bring in the complexity of ethics and mm -hmm. conscientiousness? And so this uh, it came up with these ideas of site, uh, ethics specific and site conscientiousness. So really understanding your site. So it's not so much to say, I'm going to bring this work from here and put it in that site, change a few things, it's now site specific. So site conscientiousness is where, where is the site? What is mm -hmm. the social milieu, what is the political milieu, what is the uh, cultural milieu, what's going on in this place. Um, so the conscientiousness about the site beyond the site itself. And then ethic specific means, I think, uh, in, my, in my understanding, uh, when I'm still developing these ideas really, is that what is the ethics of display in a particular site? You know, this idea that, um, of course, we can ship anything and we can travel everywhere, uh, but does that, you know, is that ethically responsible? Um, in terms of, you mentioned sustainability, but also, I think, in terms of all sorts of other aspects, you know, that the kind of ethical dilemma or ethical dimension of a site or the ethical dimension of the participation um, in a site, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. it's not something that I clearly defined, but it's things that I was thinking about in the sense that, you know, how do we go beyond just a site mm -hmm. as a place, mm -hmm. as a space, as a geographic location, um, as site, as a uh, constellation of ethical, um, uh, you know, uh, ethical factors. Uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, you know the politics, the the, the social, economic, political, um, uh, you know, environment that one displays in. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. the, I mean, you know, pre-pandemic, of course, there was a lot of discussion around, kind of, you know, the art world traveling so much. You know, curators and artists and collectors and museum people just constantly flying around the world. Um, and of course, um, uh, we all know that, of course, you know, that the, the, these things are uh, difficult to grapple with, you know, there's no simple answer. Uh, but so I wanted to move beyond this idea of just sight, you know, mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and therefore to add another layer of complexity to how we deal with sight. Yeah, but there you also mentioned a very important aspect, I think, for us today when we talk about sustainability, also the ecological challenges. Yep. And um, so this is really also part of the rethinking of biennials, how to deal with these aspects and also maybe for funding institutions, it's a very urgent question, how to include these ideas into, into funding strategies. And so what I uh, think is very interesting that, uh, well, this critique of, of biennials in regards to transport and flights, um, the art public flying around the globe to see all the large scale exhibitions, the art professionals, um, well, and the transport of the art works. Um, it's a huge topic since years and some biennials are also reacting to it, maybe not consciously, but for example, when you think of the Abidjan Green Art Biennial, which was founded in 2019 at the Ivory Coast, uh, there it's just a few artists. The production of artworks is in situ. It's all biodegradable material only allowed. It's taking place in this national park, this Banco National Park, in the middle of, of the town of Abidjan, in the capital. And um, very interesting was that two weeks ago, Rafa Niemoyevsky, the um, director of the Biennial Foundation, launched his new book mm -hmm. uh, with the title Biennials, uh, the Exhibitions We Love to Hate. And he was uh, commenting on, uh, on studies he read, he cited studies, um, also in direction of flights and travel, but he said 90% of the carbon footprint is not from flights, it's from air conditioning in exhibition spaces. So maybe we also have to have a nuanced look on, on, on these aspects. So I wonder how do biennials react to these um, ecological challenges? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I. I will say that I, I'm in no position to comment on biennials per se, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, we should avoid mm. generalization generally, right? Of course, yeah. biennials, you know, any, any exhibition that has, you know, Istanbul Biennial, Berlin Biennial, Kochi Biennial, of course, just by their name, uh, we can identify them, but that's it, mm -hmm. right? I think that's where the, that's where the, that's where the kind of um, comparison ends, because I think each, each organization, 
you know, whether you're a biennial or whether you're a residency program or whether you're a Kunsthalle or whether you're, um, you know, making a temporary project. You know, I think that these are decisions you have to make yourself uh, and that they're going to be relate to your specific ethical uh, situation, environmental, financial, political also, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. uh, certain biennials uh, can't really show whatever they want. You mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. so I don't yeah. want to comment generally on. Mm -hmm. I haven't read Raphael's book yet. Um, I do think, though, that um, there can be within the biennial field, if you like, uh, people mm -hmm. who are biennial practitioners, uh, people who organize biennials, and so on, um, a certain amount of self-criticism, mm -hmm. uh, which may actually not extend outside of our. You know, somebody described it: a museum curator is now a director of a, a major foundation in America who uh, curated a, a biennial in Asia in a Venice, uh, you know, there was a sort of meeting of biennials in Venice and she said it feels like a cult here, you know, and it, it, because, you know, biennial people are quite self-possessed about what we're doing. And so I think people coming outside of that kind of can look at us and go, God, you know, you people are a little bit, uh, you know, you're part of a cult, a biennial cult. And so um, I just want to kind of uh, distance myself mm -hmm. a little bit from that criticism to say that uh, I think, of course, self-criticism is important, um, but perhaps, you know, the general public may not sort of necessarily see the criticism that we... Um, and, and, and no point of air conditioning. In some countries, you need air conditioning, you know. Well, exactly. Um, and, um, uh, you know, simply... Uh, and, and in some countries, you know, or some locations, maybe there's no air conditioning, but that then impacts the work you show. Yeah, yeah. Or you won't even be sent work yeah. that doesn't can't exist in a climate control space. So I think that each situation is different and you know these are things that people have to decide themselves. Yeah. You know. Oh maybe it's also an idea well that artists themselves can deal with these questions by creating artworks in the outer space. Also. Outside space. Oh. <laughs> outside space, yeah. yeah. So yeah. but then we are also in the in the question of production costs well, for really uh, site specific uh, creation right. of artwork. So yeah. I think there are really multiple questions and really as you say each biennial is so differently um, acting in a different context and this is also the question for funding I guess that really yeah. you have to have a look at each project, at each, each biennial, and yeah, you can And can't each edition that. as well, right? Each edition. Because biennials, as you saw, you know, they, 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 they can evolve, right? Exactly. Uh, I mean, I know in Venice, for instance, there was a discussion a couple of years ago about recycling all the exhibition, because, you know, the false walls, you know, all the different things that go mm -hmm. into making mm -hmm. exhibitions. As soon as the exhibition's over, and there was that Steve McQueen film of the Giardini during the winter that he was that he'd shown at the Venice Biennale. I can't remember what year now, um, and, and it really looks like a kind of building site because people have really emptied out their pavilions, and then everything's kind of, you know, discarded. And so, you know, there was a lot of discussion to say, well, you know, what do we do with this material, and is there a way to recycle this? Maybe ten years ago, people weren't really asking these questions. But, you know, that's the great thing about art. It, um, art history has shown us that it, it continues to move, despite us, you know? And at some point you realize you're either behind the curve or, you know, uh, you know and, and, and things have moved on. Exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, but, um, yeah, um, we haven't talked much about funding yet, and I really want to yeah. <laughs> approach this topic as well, <laughs> because time's flying by. And uh, so we mentioned already that you are um, on the editorial board of on curating the journal, yeah. uh, where you edited or co-edited already three issues on biennials. Two. Yeah. two? Was it two? Okay. But three issues on biennials came out in a biennial two? Was it two? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. We're working so, on the third well, one. Well, yeah, yes. yeah, you're working on, on the third one. Yeah. And so I think it's really interesting what you did um, for the 2018 issue. So you really started um, asking a new set of questions or yeah. you wanted to evoke them. And I think it's interesting because when you, you look at most of the discourses which is written on biennial, it's really theoretical post-colonial studies. Yeah. For example, the Biennial Reader, which was published in 2010 after the um, Bergen Assembly. So it's really into this discourse. And what you did, you too, <laughs> uh, was an empirical study to look at um, locations, to look at founding bodies, etc., etc. And so now with the new um, edition you're working on uh, for 2022, yep. um, it's really um, a big endeavor now to look at funding and financing of 
Bayern. Yeah, it's a very interesting topic sounds for us. Sounds very boring. And, uh, it, it sounds boring, but it's really not easy because I know it from my experience as well that nobody really wants to talk about money. <laughs> and it's, it's really the cur curatorial uh, approach which is always in the focus, but uh, without money, no artworks and no biennials. Absolutely. So, and I think uh, it's it's very interesting. Um, so, what you you had like a kind of a leading question for the next um, issue that you say: Do existing funding paradigms help reproduce unequal relations and perpetuate so-called center-periphery dichotomies by creating new hegemonic effects? So, I wonder what. I think that was Ronald's line, by the way. Okay. Yeah. So maybe I, you, you I, can I, answer I, it as well, the I've question. I've signed off on it, but it's, it, it, it's really... <laughs> <lo> <laughs> 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 so um, I wonder what was the in intention and... Yeah, uh, you know, I kind of felt when I was doing my PhD and I was reading a lot of... the Because, you know, as you know, I started a... a I must say that the first, really the big inspiration for me in my life, uh, I must have been, yeah, in my early 20s, and uh, I got a call from Bose Krishnamachari, one of the founders of the Biennial. We'd sort of barely known each other at that point, and this is before smartphones, and, you know, he called me in the summer of 2002, and he said, oh, I don't know what you're doing, but you have to go to Castle. There is an exhibition called Documenta. I didn't know about Documenta. So I said, okay, and um, you know, someone who I looked up to, was a very important artist, so I said, okay, let me go. And I went to, to Documenta in the summer of 2002, and it really changed, I, would, I mean, I don't want to overstate it, but in terms of art, it really changed everything for me. I'd never seen an exhibition that big. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen works like that in an exhibition. Um, I'd never seen diversity in terms mm -hmm. of national, you know, and you had incredible artists in that biennial, you know. Um, and you even had a, you know, you even had a skateboard park in the middle of the exhibition. I mean, it was an incredible exhibition. Um, and I remember buying the book. You know, I bought the catalogue and I bought the books that I ordered. And I couldn't understand it. I mean, I was reading the books and, you know, this language was really heavy to me, you know. Um, and then, of course, I started working on, uh, you know, a decade later, I, you know, I had the opportunity to help create a biennial. And even then, I, you know, I remember we had the biennial reader. It mm -hmm. had just come out, and I remember we ordered like 30 copies, because now you can't even buy the, you can't even buy it anymore. I mean, it's so expensive. So we ordered like 30 copies, and we sent them to government. We sent them to, you know, patrons. We sent it to artists, and we said, look, this is the, this is the kind of bible on biennials, um, at the time. And, and you know, in May, 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 it's, it's, it's a key text on biennials. When I later kind of really started to study the, the discourse, the academic literature, um, I kind of felt the discourse was a little bit stuck. That in a way, you know, it hadn't really moved forward. Mm -hmm. um, the, the same ideas, the same questions were still being asked, but they were asked in new ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of felt like, okay, how do we kind of change the script a little bit? And I thought, well, you know, these questions have been asked, and they're trying to be complicated questions, which, you know, keep coming up. So I said, why don't we try and ask a new set of questions and try and look at it in a new way, right? And maybe out of that, some new questions would emerge. Uh, but it was criticized, you know, people didn't like the fact that we were counting. Uh, people didn't like the way that we were kind of trying to kind of analyze it through numbers. We did it on purpose. Uh, we did it on purpose because we wanted to ask a new set of questions, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the asking of questions is, uh, you know, they don't need answers necessarily, but I think that simply for us, asking a new set of questions, and then with students at Zadadika, we did all the research, we counted them, and we asked, you know, we looked at biennials in sort of eight or nine different categories, including yeah. are they in the capital city, or tier two city, or tier three city, because there's a lot of kind of folklore about biennials, you know, biennials don't happen in capital cities, um, uh, biennials, you know, tend to be, you know, organized around certain themes, uh, there are more than 200 biennials. People were used to, you know, no one really, so we said, okay. We're not trying to come up with some sort of definitive answer to say this is the number of biennials. And so if you look at the, if you look at the forward of that, we said very specifically, this is really time-bound research. This is published on, you know, May 2018, May 2017, I think. And, um, and this is the information as of now. And we gave all our sources and things like that. So we wanted to ask a new set of questions, and I think with this new funding and financing, um, I think it's something that, um, I think in other, in other sectors, let's say we want to look at, you know, cotton production, 
right? We would look at the numbers, we would look at the origins, we would look at the biodiversity of soils, we would look at the working conditions of the people that are uh, harvesting the cotton, we would look at the manufacturing of the cotton, we would look at the water usage of the cotton, right? Um, and then we would make an assessment on whether something was, you know, sustainable, ethical, mm -hmm. right or wrong. Mm -hmm. We don't really tend to do that in the art world, you know, we're very, um, you know, uh, money, we're, we're, you know, money sort of, you know, if you get money, you're very grateful for it. Uh, we've always been quite careful at Kochi, so we said no to certain kinds of sponsors, we said no oh. to certain kinds of money, we said no to certain kinds of branding. So somebody wanted to put their logo next to this, you know, because um, in India everything's really marketed, so it would be like Sony presents Kochi Musurus Biennale. Sony was not the <laughs> brand that asked that. But uh, <laughs> just to give you an example, you yeah, know, and we yeah. said, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. You know, look, Rolex sponsor that, but you know, you have to explain. So uh -huh. I think that. Um, Money is, of course, as you mentioned, extremely important. I don't think we can do things without resources. But I don't think we ask enough questions about mm -hmm. where the money comes from, what are the implications of that money, are there conflicts of interest. Um, and then the, 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 what we didn't want to do was just have a theoretical uh, journal to have a kind of you know, intellectual discourse. So we said this issue is going to be really very practical. So if you're mm -hmm. a biennial organizer or you're an artist or you're a producer, there will be things in there that will practically help you to make a biannual, to apply for funding, to look at contracts, to understand governance, uh, you know, these kinds of issues, as well as the discursive. And then we would also include a glossary mm -hmm. of contacts where people can, you know, because this information is available publicly, but it's not in one place. It's almost like it's a secret, but it's not a secret because, you know, uh, it's publicly available. So we thought, why don't we create a publication that addresses the, the, the complexities of funding, but is also very useful, and mm -hmm. then is also mm -hmm. helpful. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I, we're not doing this to critique biennials. We're not doing this to kind of, you know, kind of you know, create self-importance out of kind of creating, you know, uh, criticism. Um, I'm always of the, um, of the view that I think that, of course, history, of course, political debates, contemporary discussions, uh, social justice, and all these things are important, but they also have to be useful for us to kind of move forward, you yeah, know, we can't exactly. just stay in yeah. a place, yeah. uh, you know, um, criticizing, you know, we have to take that criticism, we have to then find ways and opportunities to kind of, you know, yeah. proceed and progress. And I think this is really, really um, a good idea also to include a chapter, for example, on legal aspects and um, reflecting also maybe working conditions and also address imbalances um, like also talking about artist fees. This is something which is not publicly um, done that much when talking about biennials or museum exhibitions That's as right. well. And But when you really have a close look, you can nearly say that biennials are co-financed by the artists because 100%. yeah <laughs> because yeah really it's it's their labor uh, also totally. all these um, aspects that are not directly related to the art production but as is maybe the installation of an artwork the um, press conference and all these things that they take th it takes time for an artist 100%. to be available for this yes. and so um, yeah it's really about this unpaid artists well, addressing these aspects. So, will they be part of, of your study as yeah. well? I mean, one of the problems is, and, and you know, this is often quoted that you know, art is an unregulated field, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, drugs, weapons, and art. You know, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, you know, slightly kind of, you know, uh, I would say disingenuous in the sense that certain countries have certain uh, protocols, but there isn't a global standard. And I think that's probably a good thing. I think that when we start mm -hmm. to regulate art, you know, I, I think that we're moving into a kind of um, an incredibly complicated space. However, um, these discussions on artistic labor have been kind of mainstreamed a little bit over the last decade, you know, you mm -hmm. had it in Gulf labor movement, you know, where, where, where artists started to say, you know, had, 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 had concerns about the kind of labor conditions that uh, mm -hmm. uh, people were facing. Um, and then some countries and some arts councils insist that artists are paid a fee. Some artists insist that they're paid a fee. Some artists don't care about a fee. So there is a kind of an imbalance. So let's say we at Kochi Biennial said we're going to give every artist the same fee. Mm -hmm. And you know, it roughly equates to between 1,000 and 1,500 euros. So it's about 100,000 rupees, which is a good amount of money. It's not a huge amount of money, but we said, look, we could come from Switzerland or Germany or you know, America or, or, or Brazil, or whether you come from Myanmar or, or you know, Thailand, we're going to give everybody the same fee. You know? um, and of course, artists who come from well-funded 
societies can also then apply for their own funding, and they often do. But um, there isn't any kind of, sort of, there isn't a global understanding, even if it was informal, to say that these are the kinds of uh, standards, you know. I think governance is a really a big, big kind of gap with biennials mm -hmm. and museums in the art space because governance is something that we relate to corporate governance or, you know, uh, political governance of, of society. But when it comes to art, you know, uh, we're sort of a little bit looser, uh, I would say. And that has impact. Yeah, exactly. So, you know? yeah. And I think that we have to, we have to really consider all kinds of impact, right? We can't just say that we, you know, this, I mean, I know these videos are a little bit, uh, you know, only good things are said. Believe me, lots of bad things are said about the Kochi Biennial. Uh, we can't really make a video about that. <laughs> um, although it'd be very interesting film. <laughs> um, I think that's a good idea. But, um, but you know, these aren't perfect projects. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, but that's okay, you know. We didn't set out for perfection. Um, but I think that there are... But that doesn't mean that we then get to, uh, you know, abuse that position. You know, and mm -hmm. there's often mm -hmm. a thing, well, the artist is being invited to show, that's there. Mm -hmm. It takes years in some cases to produce work. Exactly. Right? And so yeah. lots of practices that we include in mm -hmm. biennials don't have galleries. You yeah. know, they don't end yeah. up being by, bought yeah. by collectors or museums. So yeah. there's a whole economic, there's a whole kind of economic complexity here that I think that we don't address enough. Yeah. And we're not taking a position to say that this is the right thing to do and this is the wrong thing to do. I think we're very clear on that, right? There's no right or wrong, but let's have a discussion. Let's see what the contours mm -hmm. of this kind of space looks like. Yeah, exactly. There you're really saying something that um, many artists really work for biennials research based. So it's really a long process yeah. until they produce an artwork. So it can be one, two, three years of, of research and yeah. then another outcome which is visible it's just a, a tiny little bit of all this work yeah? Yeah, so yeah. and w well who pays for it in the end it's really the question and, and yeah and if you come from a, a, a country that doesn't have a strong arts funding for contemporary art yeah then you know yeah, um, uh, yeah can you know, the, the, you know so these yeah. are things that I'm yeah. conscious of yeah but so maybe my last question because uh, yeah. before we open up to to the public um, I would like to ask my last question to concerning the corona health crisis, the COVID health crisis, yeah. because I think it's really a moment to, to stop, to pause and to rethink certain strategies and uh, to, yeah, to take advantage of this moment of, of yeah, stopping and halting. And for me it was interesting also to, to discuss um, with the Berlin Biennial that uh, realizing who is the audience, for example, in times of crisis, and it's really the audience which is living in a one-hour radius. So when we always talk about this international public visitors that are going to biennials, yes, but also we have to really think about the local community and the local Absolutely. public yeah. and also I think it's very interesting to see this change of physicality um, in crisis like the current one that there are possibilities also to install an artwork with the artist via zoom yeah. or also to uh, well the challenge of making e exhibitions uh, accessible digitally yeah so where you also need uh, do, to create a, a certain kind of platform to sure. also have a, a digital version nearly of the biennial so That's I right. think there are quite a lot of challenges and um, I wonder what can be maybe the, the learning points of the COVID crisis and what might be the future of post pandemic biennials, I mean, it's a general question. Yeah, I think question, that's a whole other talk. <laughs> um, uh, but, but you know, look, Yokohama Triennale was uh, curated, uh, well, installed by Rux Media Collective uh, via Zoom. And this was early last year, you know, they couldn't travel uh, Japan, but, but Yokohama still wanted to have the biennial. And then we didn't really see any biennials. Uh, Liverpool has just closed. Uh, Berlin, of course, opened last summer. Um, but very few biennials. Of course, Venice has been postponed, Documenta sort of still going ahead but so there are lots of rupture um, I think generally though I would say about this this particular crisis I think that we've been living in a kind of compendium of crises you know mm -hmm. I think uh, in in my lifetime you know um, uh, several seismic shifts you know 9-11 um, uh, uh, the financial crisis of 2008 um, uh, the social movements that have emerged in the last five years around, you know, uh, issues of racism, issues of um, uh, sexual exploitation, 
um, you know, issues of funding, mm -hmm. um, ethical considerations, mm -hmm. um, uh, environmental, uh, ecological uh, crises that are really now forefront of the art world. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that one can pinpoint a particular crisis. I think that there are a compendium of crises. Yeah. Um, having said that, um, you know, uh, I don't think, I don't know, historically, I think there's always been challenges, you know, and I think that this particular moment, yes, I think being locked in, if you were lucky enough, because not everybody was lucky enough to stay home, you know, some mm -hmm. people had to service the people staying home and some mm -hmm. people couldn't afford to stay home depending where you lived. Uh, governments weren't all as generous and supportive to their populations globally and we see the imbalance of this particular crisis right uh, certain sections of community certain sections of society suffered much more than others so I d you know it, I, it's, I don't think the dust is going to settle on this question mm -hmm. for I think for another few years so you know let's have another conversation about it then but I just <laughs> <laughs> um, I just think definitely, I think this, this period, I think all of us, and certainly for me, or friends of mine who I've been speaking to, I think that it's allowed us to introspect and allowed us to sort of sit still for a bit, you mm -hmm. know, because obviously we're always traveling, always working, always doing this. And if you didn't do it, you were sort of somehow felt you were missing out or maybe you're professionally, you were kind of, you know, not going to succeed as much as if you didn't go, you know, that kind of thing. So I think a lot of those kind of demons maybe have... Uh, you know, and now, I, personally, I, I, you know, I don't have a desire to travel all the time, you know, and I don't have a desire to see everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I think the whole digital thing uh, that you mentioned is really interesting. You know, it's also at a time when NFTs and, you know, Web 3.0 mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. So I think that, you know, the whole digital aspect of how biennials present themselves, you know, the programs that they were doing, virtual walkthroughs, very inventive. So perhaps crisis leads to invention. I mean, historically it has. So it does, it does. And I mean, I think it's, a, it's also a process that has uh, started some years ago, really this reinventing also the format. And for example, when you think about uh, Sons Beck, um, the triennial, no, quadrennial, is quadrennial, it now? Yes. Um, <laughs> in the Netherlands, or also Oslo Biennale. We yes. didn't talk about it uh, now, but uh, I think we're running out of time. But I think it's interesting to see this process of deceleration, which it can yes. also be interesting when thinking about the COVID crisis that it's um, not that big scale exhibition at one moment, but really going into more sustainable programmations that, um, well, that cover a period of three, four years. So I think it's also, it maybe it's, it's part of this reinventing the format. And so for me, I think for me, I, it, it's interesting and I really, I'm really a fan of these new formats and of this reinventing of biennial. Sure. And I think it it's, um, enriches the diversity of biennials and it really yeah, makes me yeah. want to see even more biennials, even <laughs> when I'm not traveling. Yeah. I term it as slow <laughs> art. You know, it's, uh, I think the frantic pace, you know, three month biennial, 18 months to research. It's also related to kind of the funding of biennials because cities want people to come back every two years. So it's not as if curators have the power to say we're going to make an edition over four years. And in the case of Oslo, they've just closed their first edition two years before they meant to close it because there was a lot of opposition as well locally. Mm -hmm. A lot of discussion about whether a five year biennial is more like a museum than a biennial. So mm -hmm. um, these are all experiments and I think that they're worthy. You know, I would rather that people experimented more than simply stuck to these <laughs> rules where I don't know where they come from. I certainly haven't found a book of rules on biennials yet. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, so thank you already. Thank you very much. Um, we didn't show when all the, all the um, pictures you you brought, but maybe you can we can also say it's um, uh, you can consult. I can email this uh, PDF. I mean, we can quickly. You can just quickly sort of see. It's a kind of more of a overview. <laughs> of <laughs> but I, I think the programs are interesting. So we, as a biennial, don't just do this exhibition every two years because we work in a community where there isn't much arts infrastructure. So we really dedicate our programs a lot and so we do like the Students Biennale uh, which looks at uh, 45 government universities across India um, which is parallel to the Biennale. We do something called ABC Art by Children which this year has gone online very successfully uh, actually because the parents also get involved. We have a residency program. We invite artists uh, to do sort of practice and now this is an exhibition that's currently happening in Alipi and we have a film program, we have a music program, etc. So. 
Yeah, I think this is another, maybe another talk I would love to do with you because <laughs> for me it's interesting also biennial as places for informal education. And I think... So other, well, uh, art is a kind of form of knowledge production that sort of defies easy categorization, <laughs> absolutely. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, but thank you already and maybe there are questions from the public <laughs> as well. <laughs>